All right, guys, it's time for another edition of Hey DT. Hey DT is a series of videos I do where I respond to viewer questions and comments that I get on my YouTube videos, library videos, uh, through comments on Mastodon, Reddit, email. And the first question that I want to answer is one I got a lot the other day because I showed my mobile phone on camera and I said that I run the Brave web browser on my Android device and everybody wanted to know hey what phone do you have what model phone is that what operating system is running on that even though I told you guys it was an Android phone I guess some people assume I'm running one of the free Android alternatives and then other people were asking me don't I worry about security on my phone all right well let's tackle that first of all this is a Samsung Galaxy S10 so it's a nice phone I always buy the Samsung phones because they're just good devices they typically hold up well I have bought cheaper phones in the past and I have not had good luck with any of the cheap brand phones because you go buy a two three hundred dollar phone something like that and I promise you within a couple of months you drop it a couple of times and it just quits working the camera quits working the microphone quits working just everything about those cheap phones is bad and these Samsungs are built like a tank. I had, I think, the old Galaxy S5. I remember buying that phone, and I think I had that phone for four or five years before I finally replaced it. And it was still working when I replaced it. So even though these are expensive phones, nearly a thousand dollars, you know, the Samsung devices are worth the money. I do run just stock Android on it. I'm not a phone guy. I'm not a mobile operating system guy at all. I don't like phones as far as it's not a computer. I use a phone to make phone calls. So because it's such a expensive device too, I'm not going to, you know, try to root the device and try to install another operating system on it because again, I don't even like phones. It, it would be pointless for me to do that. I install one of these free operating systems on it. I'm still not going to play on my phone, right? It's not really a computer. My desktop that you guys see me sitting at in all my videos, you know, this workstation in front of me, that's my computer. If I didn't need a mobile phone due to work, and right now I'm actually not working, I wouldn't have a phone. I've told you guys this uh, in previous videos that I was one of the last adopters of carrying a cell phone. I went a decade after everybody else had a cell phone. I still didn't have one. I refused to get one. Finally, because of some of the jobs I had, I had to be on call 24 seven and I had to have a phone. That's the only reason I ever bought a cell phone to begin with, but I could go throw this device in the garbage right now. And I would be fine. I wouldn't miss this phone at all. Again, it's just something to make phone calls and I could be happy with a landline here at the house. As far as am I worried about security on the phone? Not that much because, again, I don't really treat this as a computer. I'm not doing anything as far as sensitive information on the phone other than uh, obviously making phone calls and occasionally sending texts. But you're always going to have to worry about that anyway, because even regardless of the operating system on your phone, you do have to worry about the carrier of the, that phone, you know, your phone uh, service provider uh, spying on you. There's really no way I get it. You have to trust somebody, unfortunately, when you have a phone. The next question comes from one of my patrons. He writes, Hey DT, how do you feel about the accusation that Emacs violates the Unix philosophy of do one thing and do it well? Well, I don't think Emacs violates the Unix philosophy at all. I think people do not really comprehend exactly what Emacs is. Emacs is one thing, and it does that one thing well. Emacs is an ELISP interpreter. And that, that's all it is. <laughs> the fact that you can write stuff in ELISP, and Emacs runs it for you. Basically, that's all Emacs is. It's an ELISP interpreter. It's an ELISP development environment, right? You write some script in ELISP and Emacs runs it for you. That's all it does. The fact that so many thousands of people have written ELISP programs that Emacs can run doesn't make Emacs bloated. You don't have to run all those programs inside Emacs, but you can if you want to. That, that's your choice, but that's not the program being bloated. If you ask me, Emacs is one of the most Unixy programs out there because it really does do one thing and do one thing well. Too many people have a misconception that Emacs is a text editor. That's not really what Emacs is.
The next question is, hey DT, did I really see you type clear, C-L-E-A-R, in the terminal? You know that Control plus L has cleared all terminals since before terminals used screen, right? Okay, I don't know why people get angry when I type the word clear in the terminal to clear the terminal. People always, I, I've gotten this question or this comment thousands of times, hey, just hit Control L in the terminal and it will clear the terminal. Yes, it will clear the terminal for you. Control L does not clear the, the terminal for me because I don't use the default Emacs key bindings in my shell. I use the VI mode key bindings in my shell. And Control L does not work if you use VI mode in your Bash shell or ZSH shell or probably any of the shells, I'm not sure. But in Bash for sure, Control L does nothing if you use VI mode. That's why I've just gotten used to just typing the word clear over the years. It is five characters long. So instead of hitting Control L two characters, I have to type five characters, the word clear. What's the difference? Now, if it really bothered me, which it doesn't, so I'm not going to bother doing it, but if it really bothers you <laughs> typing the word clear and you still wanted to use the VI mode in your Bash shell, you could set up a read line key binding inside Bash and set that to Control L or any other key binding you want to use to clear the screen. Actually, I could create a key binding in my Bash RC that would clear the screen for me if I really wanted a key binding to do that. But typing a five letter word has worked for me since I first switched to Linux 12, 13 years ago. I'm just going to keep typing the word clear. The next comment is, I don't know why so many people are interested in this, but it makes me laugh because I've gotten these comments since starting my YouTube channel, almost from day one. I've never really taken the time to answer it properly, but it goes along the lines of this. Hey DT, what products do you use for shaving your head? Do you just use standard razors? Do you use electric razors, etc., etc.? All right, so you no, know, I do use razors. I don't use an electric razor because an electric razor is only going to get you so close, right? To to really shave your head, you know, all the way down. You need to do it with a razor, uh, like a standard razor blade, but do not ever try this with like a single blade Bic razor, you know, those really cheap razors that some people will shave their face with and, and some women will shave their legs with. Don't try to use that on your head because your head, you know, has a lot of hair. It's really coarse, especially once you cut it kind of close and a single blade razor is going to just chew your head up. Make sure you buy a razor with four or five blades. What I have used for many years now have been the Schick Quadro blades. I've used those. I've also used the Gillette Fusion blades. About both of those are four blade razors and both of them work fantastically. There are specialty blades out there just for shaving your head. I remember a company a few years ago called Headblade that made razors, you know, with a handle or whatever that, you know, was built specifically for people shaving their head with that particular razor. But for me, I just use standard Schick Quattros or Gillette Fusions. And a similar question I need to answer is, Hey DT, I recently started using Linux. When does my hair fall out and when will I start vlogging outside my house? Uh, you're going to have to ask other Linux content creators this, you know, those that are actually bald and vlog outside their house all the time because I'm not one of those guys. For one thing, I have hair. I shave my head. I am not bald. Repeat after me, all of you guys. DT is not bald. And the next comment I want to read comes from a video I made a couple of days ago. I guess he really liked the lighting that I had going on in the video. He writes, Hey DT, the combined lighting of your monitors, blue, and the lighting, tungsten, make it look like some scenes from the Joker movie. And he has a point here. His comment is spot on. So typically, because I'm in this very small room and most of the lighting that I have to work with is actually these three gigantic monitors that are sitting right in front of me all the time. So really, that's how I light most of my videos. I have to be careful because if I have something really light, like light colored wallpapers or a white 
web page, you know, if you go to a website and it has a white background or I have a whole bunch of bright white going on on these monitors, it just completely washes me out. You, you know, you won't even be able to really see me. So I've gotten to the point now where before I start recording, I actually make sure I set a dark wallpaper, a really dark wallpaper if I have one handy, but sometimes I will play with the colors. Sometimes it's a dark purple, sometimes it's a dark green, sometimes it's a dark red, because I do get some different color effects going on with the lighting. So yeah, this guy was spot on. He did notice that, yeah, sometimes I, I have some weird stuff going on with the lighting from my monitors. But for right now, that's kind of what I have to deal with. Most people that do YouTube content and video content are not sitting in front of three rather large monitors that are just blasting them with light. You know, most people are, you know, have lighting stands off to the sides of them or above them. You know, they have their hair lights so they can get some reflection on their, their hair if they happen to have hair. I do have hair because remember, DT is not bald. And the next comment I want to read is, Hey DT, those headphones are interesting. They match perfectly with your bald, hairless head. I'm not bald, but he's right. Those headphones. Some of you guys notice I've recently got some new headphones. And these things are amazing. These are the Audio-Technica. They are the ADH-1000X. Anyway, they're expensive headphones. They're about $250, $300, and they do have an open back, so I can monitor what I'm saying right now through the microphone. I actually hear this because I am plugged in to the, the mixer behind me and monitoring what's going on through the microphone. But because they have an open back, I can hear what's going on in the house right now. In the rest of the room, if somebody knocked on the door, I could hear that too. So really nice. And the reason I bought these is because reading some online recommendations for comfortable headphones, I really needed a set of headphones that I could wear upwards of an hour or two and be comfortable in because especially doing the unfettered freedom podcast where I like to wear headphones so I can monitor what's going on through the mic. My previous headphones that I had, I had a cheap pair of Audio Technica, I forget what brand it is. You know, it's like a $50 pair of headphones. You know, not a bad pair. They actually sounded good, but they weren't that comfortable. They weren't open back either. They, my ears would get hot in them because, you know, the uh, the padding around them and everything. These have almost like a felt kind of padding around them, and they are extremely comfortable. And as far as the sound quality, you know, if you are an audiophile and you like listening to music with headphones, these headphones are actually quite amazing. The next question is, hey DT, can I use MU4E, which is Emacs' built-in uh, email client, can I use MU4E as a standalone terminal application without needing to run Emacs? Uh, that's an interesting question and a good question, but no, you can't. For one thing, MU4E was designed to be Emacs built-in email client. That's what it is. It's an extension of Emacs. The other thing is MU4E is written in eLisp. We already mentioned Emacs is the eLisp interpreter. If you write a script or a program in eLisp, Emacs is what you need to have installed on the system to interpret that. Even if you don't actually run Emacs, Emacs needs to be installed as your eLisp interpreter. But in MU4E's case, it is part of Emacs, so yes, you have to run MU4E inside of Emacs, unfortunately. Now, if you just want a standalone, terminal-based email client, you could try NeoMutt. I've used NeoMutt for years, and it's okay. It's fine. It's, it's not bad. Uh, MU4E, I think, is a little cleaner, a little easier to set up. It's already in Emacs, but if you don't use Emacs, just try out NeoMud. Another good one to try out is the Pine email clients, terminal-based email client, and it's pretty simple to set up. Uh, probably a little simpler than NeoMud, actually. And the final answer that I want to read and answer here on camera is, Hey DT, did you suffer from professional burnout? Have you ever suffered from professional burnout? And how do you overcome it? That is a great question because I do have some thoughts on this because I have felt burnt out at various points in my life. And the reason I can relate to this burnout question and tell you a little bit about it is, and maybe you guys suffer from this, are you one of these people that has to work all the time? I am. I hate wasting time. It 
physically makes me angry if I feel like I'm not doing anything productive at the moment. So I have to be doing something that is either making me smarter or more knowledgeable in something, you know, that's not wasted time, that's productive time, or I need to be working at a job, either trying to make myself more successful in a professional setting or just make more money. You know, I have to have some tangible goal that I'm trying to achieve. So I can't just be sitting around doing nothing. I can't just watch TV, you know, mindless TV programs. I can't just be playing video games. I can't do any of that stuff. If I'm doing that stuff, I feel bad. I feel guilty. I feel like I'm not really doing what I should be doing. And that's why I make so much video content <laughs> as far as YouTube and library is because if I'm not doing something, you know, it's always easy to turn on the camera and, and make a video. Well, it's not easy, but at least I'm doing something. So in my life, Obviously, the video content that I create takes up a big portion because there's so much time invested in making these videos. A typical video of mine is going to take me four to six hours of, t of, of a block of time to make because of the recording then the editing. The editing process can take a few hours. You have to upload it. And you have to create a thumbnail. You got to do a lot of work. You know, there's a lot of work involved in this. And that's OK. I don't mind working hard. I like working hard. But working hard all the time can burn you out. Uh, other than that, too, when I'm not doing the video. So I make this video today. I spend four, maybe six hours making this video today and then I'm done. Well, what am I going to do after that? Well, most people would be like, well, I did my work for today. I can just relax. Not me. I'm going to have to do something again that's productive. I'm going to have to go to the gym. You know, my workout schedule, especially here in the last few years, I'm really taking uh, physical fitness seriously, trying to be in better shape. So I'll go to the gym almost every day and I'll spend an hour and a half at the gym. Typically when I go to the gym, you know, at least an hour, sometimes upwards of two hours, I'd say hour and a half on average that I spend at the gym and I go typically four or five days a week. So that is a serious time commitment. And there are days I don't want to go to the gym. There are days I don't want to go lift weights. I have no energy. I'm still sore from what I did at the gym the day before or uh, what I did in the yard or whatever. You know, especially, you know, I'm in my 40s. There are days that I just feel like I don't have anything. I have no energy. I've got nothing to give. I still make my ass go to the gym and put in that time. Uh, even if I'm sick, and I, uh, this is really crazy, if I had the flu or a cold or something, and I really know I can't lift weights, and I certainly can't do any cardio if you're having trouble breathing or something because you're sick, you know, I'll still go to the gym. <laughs> I'll drive to the gym. I may not even go in, or if I go in, I'm not going to go to the machines. You know, if they have a couch or some area, you know, I may just sit down for 10, 15 minutes or whatever, play on the phone or whatever, but, and then get back in the car and go home. But just to stick with the routine, just to make myself go and come back, just so it doesn't feel like I took a day off. Another problem with me is not just that I, I feel like I need to be doing something productive all the time. I also have this other problem where I become singularly focused on one task. If I have a task, I'm going to complete it. I become obsessed with getting that task done. Don't come at me with another problem because I, I can't even hear about it. You can tell me about it. I, I don't want to know about it because I still have to get this other thing done. And it's one of those things, especially in the workforce, you know, you, once you get out and get a job, you know, many places talk about wanting people to be multitaskers. I've never been a multitasker. You know, a boss can give me five different things to do. I'm going to start one of them and I'm going to complete that one task you know, before I even think about the others where, you know, some people want you to be multitaskers where you just kind of half-ass the five jobs that they gave you. You don't really complete any of them, but you kind of worked on all of them. I can't be like that. My mind doesn't work like that. And I know sometimes it gets me into trouble. And I know, especially the, the working the way I do sometimes, the fact that I put so much time and effort, you know, physical effort and mental effort working, you know, these videos that I do is a great example. I have felt burnt out like, hey, uh, I need to back off a little bit. And I do recognize that. I've, now I'm to the point where I can recognize it when it's happening, especially the way I work out too. I, I, sometimes it feels like, 
hormone levels are just out of balance. You know, you start getting irritable and angry. Uh, you just feel like things are not right. And that's when you have to tell yourself, hey, back off. Hey, today you're taking the day off. Today you're not going to the gym. Hey, today you're not making a video. Just back off. And there have been periods of time where I've done that, where I make myself, even though I have nothing to do, you know, I, I feel like I need to sit down and make a video. I make myself not turn on the camera just for sake of health, because I can tell you another thing. The more you push yourself, the more stress you put on yourself and the more that you don't have any downtime, any decompression time. Stress levels go way up. Blood pressure is sky high and it will lead to an early grave if you don't make yourself back off. Now, most people probably don't push themselves to that point, but there are some people that push themselves to that point because they feel like that's the only way to be successful. And I'm kind of like that. It's like if I work hard enough, I'll get ahead. But you also have to realize that you, there's a, a point of diminishing returns where you really should not be working. <laughs> like, you know, you work a job 40 hours a week, right? Well, you could work it 50 hours a week. Yeah, maybe. You could also work at 60 hours a week, but hey, once you start getting to that point, are you really giving it your best at 60 hours a week? Are you really bringing your A game? No, you're not. And I have worked, you know, 60, 70, 80 hours in a work week before. And at that point, you shouldn't even be there because you're not even doing your job at that point. You're so tired mentally. You have no idea what's going on. I, I've been so tired before working when, you know, somebody could just come up to you, push you <laughs> and you'd fall over. So there are points of diminishing returns and you just have to recognize when you get there and just make yourself take the day off. Now, before I go, I need to thank a few special people. I need to thank Michael, Gabe, Corbinian, Mitchell, Devin, Fran, Arch5530, Akami, Chuck, Claudio, Donnie, Dylan, George, Kelly, Devils, Lewis, Paul, Scott, and Willie. These guys are the producers of this episode. They are my highest tiered patrons over on Patreon. I'd also like to thank each and every one of these ladies and gentlemen as well. These are all my supporters over on Patreon because, again, this channel is supported by you guys, the community. I couldn't do this without you guys, and I'd really appreciate it if you would support me. Check out DistroTube over on Patreon. All right, guys. Peace.